let's start straight away. Um, we talk about the dinner associated virus mediated gene therapy in monogenic liver diseases. Okay, I work in Bergamo as Claudio has shown, and I think I should start uh, with some uh, with some conflict of interest first. Um, uh, okay, I'll, uh, I'm involved with some gene, gene therapy uh, companies, and I I will actually present some studies uh, supported by these companies today. Uh, um, what I will show you in terms of my direct clinical experience is a trial which is supported by, sponsored by Geneton, which is actually a non-profit. Uh, so this, these are my conflict of interest. And uh, this is my uh, outline, uh, what I, I would like to talk about today with you. Um, gene therapy, the, the main strategies, liver disease is amenable to effective gene therapy. We cannot treat any liver disease at the moment. The challenges in liver-directed gene therapy, the ongoing and future clinical trials and some conclusions if possible. Um, so what are the main strategies for gene therapy? First of all, what is the definition uh, of gene therapy? It's the introduction of nucleic acids into the cells or organism with the intention of altering gene expression to prevent halt or reverse a pathological process. And we can do it uh, through different ways. Uh, one is administering the correct genes, uh, gene addition, or correct edit the defective gene, or activate one gene, or again provide a gene with a new function, or switch off an, an effective gene, what we call gene knockdown. And um, what, what do we use? Well, if, uh, the vectors we use uh, are, uh, it might be different. The uh, adeno associated vector has a, a, a capsid. There is a therapeutic transgene. Uh, and what is important to remember is that each uh, uh, AV serotype has a single target or, or a special target cell or tissue. So usually we use one vector for one tissue. Um, there are two main strategies in term, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, vectors, uh, viral vectors mediated gene therapy. One is the ex vivo. So this, this, um, this gene therapy takes advantage of, of the fact that the bone marrow can be taken out, manipulated in the lab. Uh, the cells can be transduced by a virus, uh, which is an integrative, uh, integrating into the DNA. Uh, genome, the lentivirus, and then the bone marrow is, uh, is uh, uh, infused back to the patients in uh, autologous bone marrow transplantation. This is used in primary immunodeficiencies, mainly um, hematological disorders, let, let's say. What we talk about is a strategy that can be adopted uh, to, the, to liver diseases. Obviously, we cannot take the liver out to, to transduce hepatocytes. Uh, Therefore, we need to adopt an in vivo strategy uh, with a vector ca that can be infused in a peripheral vein and can reach the liver, uh, having a tropism for the liver cells. Uh, this is an associated virus. This is used, uh, has been used for hemophilias. Uh, I will show you my experience with Kirin Ajar, but also for other organs and tissues, eye disorders or urea cycle or lysosomal storage disorders. What is the adeno associated uh, virus vector? Well, if you look at the wild type AV, this is a small parvovirus. It cannot replicate itself and it is not pathogenic. This is the, uh, the DNA of the virus with, uh, with a domain meant to uh, lead the re replication and one for the capsid. But what we use uh, are recombinant AV vectors. Again, they cannot replicate, so they do not have viral coding sequences because the DNA is replaced by a tissue specific promoter and a therapeutic uh, DNA. Uh, it is predominantly uh, non integrating into uh, the host genome. And this is the, uh, let's say, the, the, the infection uh, cycle. Uh, the virus is uptaken by the cell into an endosome, then it is released, it gets into the uh, nucleus uh, where, where it uncodes and the uh, DNA uh, 
uh, in this case, a single strand DNA becomes an episome. It is recognized by the system and it is uh, then uh, transcripted and transduced into uh, the, uh, the protein. So, uh, uh, in practice, in, pra in, in, in practice, what do we do? We just do a peripheral vein infusion. Uh, actually, uh, this strategy uh, can take advantage of a single infusion, at least so far, because the virus is recognized by the immune system, and then uh, the immune system forms neutralizing antibodies. But the virus, uh, you know, meanwhile, has reached the hepatocytes, it gets into uh, the sinusoids and, uh, and into the hepatocytes through the fenestrated endothelium. And into the hepatocytes, this is the example of Krivina jar. Uh, the, the virus is uh, within the endosome, it is released, it gets into the nucleus where it uh, uh, uncodes again. And this is a single strand DNA that forms an episome, therefore, it does not integrate. This is recognized, it is transcripted into mRNA, then translated into the protein that uh, in, the case, uh, in this case is uh, UGT101 that allows bilirubin conjugation in patients with KNHR. What are the diseases, uh, uh, liver disease, amenable to effective gene therapy? It is important to, uh, to, to remember some, some uh, issues uh, uh, that, that uh, go along with this strategy. First of all, each AV serotype has dropping for a single somatic cell, or anyway, we, we choose the best suitable uh, serotype to target one single organ. And uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cassette includes a, a liver-specific promoter and a transgene. Therefore, this vector is very organ-specific, it's very tissue-specific. A liver-directed vector corrects only the hepatocytes because uh, you know the vector has tropics for that, and there is a promoter that can be expressed only in, in the hepatocytes. This is why it is important to note the extrahepatic expression of the disease. There are diseases that are just uh, uh, confined to the liver, therefore this strategy is very effective, and there are liver diseases that are expressed outside the liver, but the vector will not be correcting the disease in those uh, tissues. If we look at monogenic diseases, we, we, we can classify them according to the systemic, let's say the extra hepatic expression. And just a reminder, since the treatment is hepatocyte specific, it's important to know the extra hepatic expression of the disease. For instance, there are some diseases confined to the liver, such as Krieger-Najar syndrome, mainly, let's say, or, or uh, you know, almost exclusively, OTC deficiency, the progressive familiar hepatic cholestasis, hemophilia, and some others. Um, but there are many others that are actually expressed outside the liver, some uh, uh, organic acidemias, or maple syrup urine disease, or familiar amyloid polyneuropathy, or some others you might be more familiar, including uh, uh, Wilson disease, for instance. And also the mechanism is important because uh, uh, there are several types of metabolic injury in these genetic disorders. For instance, there might be the lack of systemic detoxification. Uh, in Kegel and Jar, there, is, uh, there is a toxic compound which is unconjugated bilirubin that cannot be converted into conjugated bilirubin. The same is for organic acidemias or MSUD. So we have a substrate and we need to convert the substrate into a non-toxic metabolite. Or we might uh, have the lack of uh, liver uh, detoxif uh, detoxification, such as in OTC or in tyrosinemia. Uh, in some diseases, we have a problem with biliary ex excretion, for instance, with progressive familial enteropathic cholestasis. Or the mechanism of injury might be a storage type. For instance, in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the problem is a storage of an abnormal protein rather than a toxic or a lack of an enzymatic uh, um, you know, uh, effect, action, activity. Or we might have a lack of circulating proteins synthesized by the liver. For instance, in, in hemophilia, the liver is perfectly normal, but the liver is making factor eight and nine, 
uh, which is uh, required for normal clotting. Uh, so in this condition, the liver acts as a factory of factor eight and nine without having any uh, proper disease. It is also possible to use the liver as a factory in some other storage or metabolic diseases. For instance, in lysosomal storage disorders, we might treat the disease using the liver as a factory of an enzyme which can be secreted uh, in, into the systemic circulation uh, after having been synthesized by the hepatocytes. In this paper, we looked uh, at uh, uh, monogenic diseases uh, and uh, in our series of, uh, of actually nearly 1,000 uh, pediatric liver transplants, those transplants were made uh, for a genetic disease. If you look here, uh, these are the pediatrics. This is the, our pediatric series. There is also the other series of monogenic diseases that went into transplantation. Um, there are organic acidemia, serious cycle defects. Why it is important? to have some idea of what happens with liver transplantation in this condition. Because liver transplantation is a sort of surgical gene therapy. With transplantation, we uh, turn all the, all the hepatocytes of the liver into a normal genotype. Therefore, liver transplantation is like, uh, is, it might be compared to a strategy, gene therapy strategy able to correct uh, each single hepatocyte in the liver. So if transplantation does not correct the disease, it is quite unlikely or impossible that gene therapy, you know, targeting exclusively the, the liver can correct the condition. For instance, uh, if you look at these, uh, these cartoons, you can see that uh, Krivenon jar this side, PFIC2 this other side. Uh, here are all the tissues, I hope you can see this. And uh, this, this side is the RNA expression, the right side uh, is the protein expression. Krigan ajar uh, is expressed in the gastrointestinal tract and the liver. So it is almost exclusively expressed uh, in, the, in the liver. PFIC2 is another condition which is almost exclusively expressed in the liver. In these conditions, liver transplantation is curative because there is no hepatic expression of the defect. But if we look at uh, some organic acidemias, uh, such as methymalonic acidemia, you can see that the brain, the endocrine tissue, the respiratory system, also the liver, but many, many tissues are expressing the defect. Therefore, in this condition, liver transplantation might improve a little bit the, the phenotype, but cannot correct the disease. Same uh, might be thought for MSUD, which is expressed everywhere in the body. But curiously, in this disease, liver transplantation is curative. So this is a little bit of another aspect we should take into account. Why a disease expressed in extrahepatic CNS tissue might be cured by liver transplantation. For instance, this one, or another one you might be familiar with, is Wilson disease, which is uh, widely expressed in extrahepatic tissues, but it is actually completely corrected by liver transplantation. So the point is that what we need is to have uh, the toxic metabolites uh, you know, going to the liver. If we have a tissue which is extrahepatic tissue producing toxic metabolites, but the, that metabolite can travel to the liver, then a new liver can uh, clear the blood and also the other tissues from this toxic. For instance, the, in these diseases, uh, there is some production of uh, toxic metabolites in the brain, but only some of these, uh, the toxic metabolites, can cross the blood-brain barrier. Among these, there are methylcerebrin disease and Wilson disease, copper is in this case, the toxic metabolite. So the toxic metabolites produced in the CNS can reach the liver in these conditions. Therefore, liver transplantation is actually curative. The same is true. Uh, um, about toxic metabolites produced, for instance, in the muscle or in other extrahepatic tissues. So after that, the detoxified blood returns to the systemic circulation and can correct the disease at uh, CNS level and also in other tissues. So 
actually liver transplantation can correct also diseases expressed uh, uh, at uh, extrahepatic level, uh, provided the uh, metabolic toxins can travel to the liver. The liver that toxifies in MSUD and Wilson disease, uh, the metabolites that can travel from the CNS uh, to the liver, then, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, in this condition, which is quite peculiar, uh, liver transplantation is actually a solution also if the disease is expressed outside of the liver. Okay, so what are the main challenges in liver-directed gene therapy? I was mentioning earlier on that for gene therapy with AAV at the moment we have the possibility to do only a single infusion. Why is that? Because there is a fast humoral response, uh, there is a formation of neutralizing antibodies, the neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, impedes the, the vector uh, to, to get to the hepatocytes and the vector is neutralized as in this case. This is a patient without antibodies, the vector gets uh, to, the, to the target receptor uh, and then in, into the target uh, cell. But if we have neutralizing antibodies, then uh, the vector is neutralized and cannot reach the target tissue. This is the situation of patients who have uh, encountered the AAV, uh, the wild type AAV, before the treatment. So they will have preformed uh, antibodies and uh, obviously after a single infusion or, or AV, they will, they will form a, a big amount of neutralizing antibodies. So the development of antibodies in pizza second administration, just one is possible at the moment, although we're trying to develop strategies to allow a second, uh, second infusion or even more. Then there is the, uh, the T cell, the cellular response. After the vector has reached the, the target cell and uh, some, some vector antigens are exposed uh, to the antigen and presenting cell, and there is an immune response, a cellular immune response that is able to destroy the uh, transduced uh, hepatocytes. So we, we need to uh, take into account that. Uh, after effective transduction, uh, there is uh, almost always after, let's say, eight to 12 weeks, a T cell response that can just jeopardize the treatment through uh, destruction of, uh, uh, of uh, transduced cells. Importantly, you know, one thing is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, treating a disease with a preserved ar architecture. Different is if the architecture is deranged. In these diseases, uh, the liver has a nearly normal architecture, but in these others, BFIC, alpha-1 antitrypsin, Wilson, uh, you know, these, these genetic diseases, uh, we have fibrosis and development of, of cirrhosis. Gene therapy, is ineffective and can be toxic in presence of fibrosis. So these patients uh, most likely respond less and they might have some increased toxicity. Having said that, uh, we, we still don't know uh, very much about it, but we should certainly try to treat early on before fibrosis is established. Um, Importantly, there is a loss of efficacy with growth. Uh, this is a slice that's been uh, given to me by Andres Moro, which with uh, I collaborate, and it is quite nice to work together. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the viral DNA activity uh, during growth. You know that, uh, that uh, you see that the liver is, uh, is expected to grow uh, to the adult size, uh, over 10, 12 years. So a child at 12 years of age more or less have the same liver size of an adult. If we treat a patient, this is, this is shown also by the, you know, the, this publication by Julia Bortolucci and Andres, um, with liver growth, the vector activity gets diluted 
And uh, if you look uh, again uh, at, the, at the genome in mice, uh, we can see that if you treat very early on, over time, you have a dilution of this uh, of the of the genome and also if we talk about uh, trigonal jar model even ugta uh, 1a activity goes down therefore uh, the episodal dna since it is not integrated is not inherited by by the cells upon division therefore it is important to take into consideration that uh, a growing liver will uh, lose some efficacy uh, over the years I just wanted to mention to you some, some ongoing and future clinical trials, including the trial uh, I'm doing on Enquivenachar. These are the trials that are under investigation um, uh, you know, yeah, to treat, uh, targeting the, the liver, let's say. So hemophilia A and B, these are the, the, the very successful trials you will know about, but also many others, including Western disease, the Enquivenachar, as I was mentioning, OTC deficiency, several diseases with different mechanisms of injury, but then there are also neuromuscular disorders uh, treated with AAV uh, with much higher doses actually, spinal muscle atrophy. So this, the target here is the, is the muscle. It's linked to myopathy to shen uh, muscle dystrophy. So uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting because I told you that maple syrup urine disease, uh, it, although it is uh, expressed outside the uh, liver, uh, it can be cured by liver transplantation. So let's see this preclinical experience with gene therapy in, in a mouse model of uh, MSUD. And uh, um, I'll try to get you through this experiment. Today I've used two different vectors. One is ubiquitous, so expressed even outside of the liver and one is liver specific. This is to show that they have a good model. Um, so this is the level of leucine in the, in the mouse model. So the mouse expressed uh, you know, the, the, the effect quite nicely. Um, well, if these mice are treated with an ubiquitous promoter, then uh, the, there is a good efficacy uh, certainly in the heterozygous mice, but also in the homozygous uh, uh, mice, uh, there is a good decrease uh, uh, down from some 5,000 to 400. This is leucine concentration. So the ubiquitous uh, vector can correct uh, uh, this model. But if we look only at the, uh, at the vector that is targeting only the liver, with only a liver promoter, then uh, we will see that uh, this vector uh, will not change uh, the concentration of leucine, will not be able to correct entirely the disease. It, it might improve the phenotype, but not correct the disease. Why is that? Why uh, in this mouse model we need an ubiquitous vector to correct MSUD, whereas in liver transplantation, uh, we see that the disease is corrected by the procedure. The reason is simple. If we do liver transplantation for maple syrup for MSUD, we will have a donor. This donor has 100% activity uh, for, for, for this condition, so it's healthy. Whereas uh, uh, the recipient has no activity at all. So if we take the liver from the donor and we transplant into an MSUD recipient, we can provide only part of the overall uh, BCKD H enzymatic activity, which is calculated to be 15%. So a transplanted patient with MSUD has, uh, has restored 15% of the enzymatic capacity. But this is enough this is enough to allow some metabolic control. Enzymatic activity of 15% is just sufficient to correct the disease. But can we have a, a, a gene therapy strategy to target the whole liver and provide 15% of the whole enzymatic activity? Well, we, we should transduce all the parasites, each one of them, to reach the same efficacy. This is why gene therapy is unlikely to correct uh, uh, MSUD unless you use an ubiquitous vector. 
This is an experience with OTC, again, these are slides uh, given to me uh, by Andres Muro, is a uh, study we are uh, collaborating on. Um, this is a study on SPF ash mice, the model of OTCD. This is the cassette with a liver specific promoter. And uh, this is erotic acid, which is the marker, the metabolite. As you can see, this is the untreated mice, uh, whereas these uh, are mice treated with two different uh, uh, vector doses. As you can see, the level of erotic acid uh, goes below uh, the upper limit of normal nicely. And the same is for the catalytic activity. In the wild type uh, is like that, and in, in, in the higher dose uh, of uh, gene therapy in this model, the enzymatic activity is more or less uh, the same as in the wild type. Hopefully, we will uh, go to the clinical soon in this trial, which is already approved. Um, this is another trial on Wilson disease. Um, the, the PI is Michael Shinsky. And um, this is a, one, a phase one two multicenter, no randomized open label, a single dose escalation st study of again another AAV in Wilson disease patients. These patients are treated uh, with some immunosuppression. Uh, they do some radiocopper evaluation to, to see the, uh, you know, uh, the excretion of copper in the stool. And then uh, uh, there are the responders uh, and the non-responders, those who respond, uh, stop treatment. Uh, and this trial is actually all open to enrollment and I, I really look forward to seeing the results. The Morphilia A is probably the most famous, the one that has been established as a treatment. Uh, this is the last publication on Morphilia A. Maybe you will remember there are other papers published earlier on uh, by Natwani. Uh, for instance, the first paper on just a handful of patients, then other papers uh, uh, published in more patients. These are 18 patients. Uh, you see the enzymatic activity of factor eight uh, goes nicely up and is maintained in the long term. Uh, what is most important is that in these patients, bleeding, either traumatic, the blue, or the spontaneous in red, uh, disappears after treatment. This is a disease which is quite rewarding because even an increase of uh, a small percentage of uh, factor eight activity allows the disappearance of bleed. So this is this is really a, good, a successful, uh, a, very, a, a big success in gene therapy, and this treatment is actually licensed in the EU. So to uh, to finish my presentation, I will show you the preliminary data. Uh, of, uh, of our trial in Krivinachar, the QRCN trial. Uh, these are the six months of follow-up data that have been already disclosed, uh, presented at the ESOL and the ASLD meeting. Now the follow-up is much longer, but it is still unpublished. Uh, this is our transgene. We have our cassette, UGT101, and the promoter is alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is obviously liver-specific. And we have this timeline, the baseline, and then we have a cohort one with a lower dose and cohort two with a higher dose. And, uh, uh, and then we, will, we, we choose the best dose according to you know, safety and efficacy, and we, we will go ahead with a pivotal trial. Now we are at this point, we have done cohort one and cohort two, and we are about to start with the pivotal uh, group. Uh, this is a uh, phase one, two multi-center dose escalation study. The inclusion criteria are adults so more than 18 years, but actually once the, the first phase has shown uh, that the treatment works well, we will be able to go down to pediatric age as well. Uh, we can enroll patients who are under phototherapy, therefore uh, severe forms, no antibodies against AV, no preformed, uh, antibodies, no fibrosis, no relevant fibrosis. So there are two doses. The first dose is two times 10 to the 12, and the second is five times 10 to the 12. 
uh, endpoints obviously safety as this is a one as it is a phase one two trial and then efficacy efficacy is uh, is defined as the safe interruption of phototherapy at week 16 after the treatment uh, this is a protocol uh, these patients are under phototherapy uh, there is a baseline assessment then we start immunosuppression a week before the administration of uh, the investigational medical product uh, and then the immunomodulation goes on for 12 weeks uh, and then it, it is stopped. That includes uh, serolimus and prednisone for eight weeks. Then at week 16, we, if we see the efficacy, we stop phototherapy and obviously that's the end point. Uh, maintenance of uh, uh, reduced bilirubin after uh, a week from stopping phototherapy, and then we follow them up. Therefore, let's see uh, the results of the two codes. Uh, I will show you patient by patient the six months follow. Uh, we treated to, just to just to show you a little bit more about the patients five not six patients because after two patients you will see we have seen that this dose is not effective so we stopped uh, we, we did not treat the third patient in the first court and we have treated three in, in court two uh, they had uh, at least seven hours of phototherapy per day and they had bilirubin levels between 220 and uh, 350 micromoles per liter we did not have uh, uh, serious uh, adverse events related to IMP and in general we didn't have serious adverse events um, but I will show you that we had some minor adverse events um, but let's see patient by patient this is patient one this is called one the low dose this patient started from a bilirubin up there next to 400 uh, and received the infusion of this dose 2 times 10 to the 12 bilirubin nicely came down but then over the you know the first uh, two months, bilirubin went up again, and uh, uh, this patient uh, massively had a bilirubin that uh, went back to pre pre-treatment levels, so could not stop phototherapy. This patient did not uh, did not uh, uh, reach the criteria for a successful treatment. Patient two. We see the same dose and again even this patient responded uh, mildly and then after stopping phototherapy actually the, the bilirubin was already going, going up so this patient actually stopped but then had to restart because bilirubin went up to pre-treatment levels so this dose the low dose was not successful it was temporarily successful we might say it was subtherapeutic Therefore, we decided not to go ahead with a third patient, but we started the higher dose. The higher dose is 5 times 10 to the 12, and this is uh, the first patient in core 2. You see the bilirubin coming down very, very nicely and remaining down up to 6 months of follow-up. This patient received serolimus for 3 months, uh, then we gave prednisone. Also, at some point, when we expect this uh, response, the patient had some increase in ALT, so received an extra course uh, of uh, uh, prednisone to counteract you know, the uh, T-cell response and save uh, the, uh, the function of transducer pathocytes. So first patient uh, reached the endpoint. Second patient again went down very nicely. You see very, very soon bilirubin goes down. Uh, this patient stopped phototherapy and actually bilirubin was so low that stopping phototherapy really didn't change much. And this patient ended up with a level of 50 uh, of bilirubin at uh, six months. So again, quite nice and successful at these dose. The fifth patient, pretty much the same. Bilirubin coming down very, very nicely and remaining down to 50 at six months of follow-up. Again, sometimes there is a rise of ALT that we treat with steroids because we don't want to lose even one cell um, just to preserve the function of transducer hepatocytes. So these patients actually have reached the end point and corrected the disease. 
and uh, I think it was quite nice uh, to see that these uh, three patients uh, who received a higher dose uh, actually uh, cleared the jaundice. This is uh, this is this just to just to quote. Uh, this is sponsor, sponsored by Geneton and it's also supported by uh, Horizon 2020 grant. So, uh, in conclusion, a gene therapy represents the new frontier for the treatment of genetic liver disease. I think it is a fantastic and very exciting field for clinicians uh, working up their patients with uh, genetic liver disorders. Adeno-associated virus mediated gene therapy is already successful in clinical trials for hemophilia, and I think these preliminary results show that also in clinical jar it is possible to correct the disease. Limitations uh, uh, are the efficiency of liver transduction, the presence of extrahepatic expression of the disease that does not allow to use a, a vector targeting one tissue uh, to treat all liver diseases, the need to treat early in life because some patients will develop fibrosis, the toxicity risk, the possible loss of efficacy over time because of hepatocyte tumor. And I thank you very much.